up in the fear of God and listen to the Holy Gospel, a chapter from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the evangelist, apostle, and pure disciple. May his blessing be with us all. Oh, Amen. From the Psalms of our teacher David, the prophet and king, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. For you, God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. So praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. In the name of the Lord, our Lord, our God, our Saviour and King of us all, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to whom is glory, he Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will this kingdom? How then will this kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub. By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or else how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. He is not with me, he is against me, and he does not gather with me, scatters abroad. 
Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks of the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come, either make the tree good and its fruits good, or else make the tree bad and its fruits bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by words you will be justified. And by your words you'll be condemned. Glory be to God for ever. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Dearly beloved, today is the third Sunday of the blessed fast of the apostles. And throughout the fast of the apostles, the Sunday readings are focused on the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit that was being manifested not only through the apostles, but also continues to work through us. And if you recall last week, last week the reading was about the paralyzed man with the four friends, and the focus there was the Holy Spirit as the healer. Today our church presents us with a beautiful gospel regarding the blind and mute man who was demon-possessed and our Lord healed him. And after he healed him, we saw that there was a certain wave of accusations that came to him. But then he started to talk about the Spirit. So what does the church give us this particular reading today and what is the church teaching us about the characteristics of the Holy Spirit? May our Lord grants us wisdom to be able to understand and know the beauty of the treasures of his holy word such that we can not only understand them but live them as well. So just before this reading in Matthew chapter 12, we see our Lord healed someone on the Sabbath who had a withered hand. And so the Pharisees at that point in time are seeing our Lord Jesus Christ gaining more and more followers. And those followers are continuing to question and start to believe that he is the Son of God, the promised Messiah. Obviously to them, they're seeing someone that's breaking traditions and breaking the law that they so much try to upkeep continuously. And so what's the self-defense mechanism when they see our Lord take out a demon from this particular man and heal him. They accused him of taking out the demon by Beelzebub, who is the head of, all, uh, head of all the demons. Our Lord, 
categorically broke down that accusation and said to them, how is it that a demon will take out a demon? How is it that a house that's divided against itself can stand, a kingdom against itself, how will it stand if it's divided? He also said to them, because many of his followers were their people, were their children. He said, well, you're seeing your children also take out demons. So are they taking them out by Beelzebub as well? And he gave him an example about this strong man and plundering his house. And the context here is that the strong man is Satan, the house is the world, as he is the prince of the world. And the only way that he, he can take his possessions, which is the children of God that he's holding captive, was that he had to be bound first. But at this point in time, he starts to talk about the spirit. Where in verse 28, he says, the kingdom of God can only be achieved through the spirit of God. And then he further goes on to talk about that you can blaspheme against the Son of, uh, Son of God, but you can't blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. It's known as the unpardonable sin. Now, we know that their hearts were hardened and that they were looking for any way to be able to accuse our Lord and detract the crowds from him. And what he's trying to teach them that the only way you're going to be able to see me and recognize me is through the Spirit. And this is why our Lord says, if you say a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven, but not against the Holy Spirit. Why? You can imagine the people at that time were getting to know him. They were questioning him. Is this really the Messiah or not? Or is this just some random person doing things and trying to confuse us? So he said to them, even if you're doubting, even if you say something about me in terms of not the truth, if you believe, your sin will be forgiven. But once you believe, the Holy Spirit in you will continue to sustain that belief will continue to guide you in the path of confirming that belief. And it's only through that belief that the kingdom of God can come upon you, as he said in verse 28. And that's why our church fathers explained this to us, that the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the continual resistance of the Holy Spirit continuing to ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. As we know, the Holy Spirit has got three characteristics. The Holy Spirit is the guider, the teacher, and the peace giver. The guider in terms of showing us the way of Christ and confirming us in his salvation. The teacher in terms of teaching us how we should live on this earth such that we continue on that way. And the peace giver such that if we are on that way, that we have peace. If we're not following that way, there will be something in us that is missing. Something in us that's always reminding us of, you don't have that inner peace right now. And this is why so many times in our life we find ourselves in situations where we feel troubled, where we feel afraid, where we feel that we're alone because we forget what our Lord is telling us today. That it's through the Holy Spirit that dwells in you that's teaching you the way, that's showing you the way, that you'll have comfort. The way of his salvation, the acknowledgement that our Lord Jesus Christ is our God. (laughs) 
And we do see real examples of those that blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and things that do happen to them. The first example that we see in the book of Acts is Hanania and Zephira, who went and sold their possessions, but their love for money and their love for possessions was more than their belief in the salvation that they received. And when they went and lied to the apostles about how much that they had sold it for, the result was immediate death. You may say, Abunata, that's at the time of the apostles. Perhaps things at that time were still in the newness of the church and God wanted to prove a point. This continues to happen through all generation. I'll share with you a real life story that happened in Alexandria, and this is in the history of our church. There was these two men that were quite poor beggars, you may say, who lived in Alexandria. And they lived in a shack that was outside the fence of a very wealthy man. And they were both Christians. They toiled and they labored and they tried, but they couldn't really change their situation. So one of them said, look, I'm just going to go and knock on this rich man's door and see if he can help us. And so he went and knocked, and the rich man opened for him and he said, I'm sure you've noticed us as you've gone in and out of your home. We really need help. And the rich man said to him, I would be more than happy to help you. Yet my religion forbids me to help those that are not of the same religion. This is what we've been taught as the Jewish nation. The nation of God is to help each other and to focus and support each other. So unless you are of the same religion as me, believing in the Torah, I can't help you. The poor man was quite sad and left, told his friend. And this kept on going through his mind. He got to the point where he felt that he could no longer live this life. And he said to his friend, you know what? We're Christians. What did we benefit from Christianity? Look at the state that we're living in. This is how we were born and this is how we're going to die. If this is really a God, wouldn't he have mercy on us? I'm going to go to that man and I'm going to convert to his religion. His friend begged him not to leave Christ, but he didn't listen. He went to the man, and the man was very happy, and he said, look, before I can help you, I need you to come with me to the synagogue and be able to proclaim your faith. He said, okay. So he went with him. He went to the synagogue, and in the synagogue, he met the elders there, and they said, look, we need to be able to do this properly. There's going to be a ceremony. All the elders of the synagogue are going to be invited, and you're going to come, and there's going to be certain rights that you have to confirm in terms of you accepting the Jewish faith. And he obliged and said, I'm at your disposal. You let me know the date and time. And so they set a date and time, and he went. And the synagogue was full of people to witness his conversion. Throughout the ceremony, they brought out a large-sized cross with Christ on it. And they said to him, to confirm your acceptance of our religion, we need to see you not just denounce Christ, but take this little sword and pierce his side as we saw in history, in terms of when the world let him go and denounced him. 
the cross was made of wood material and the statue of Jesus on it was also of hard material. This poor man took the cross, went to the cross and took the sword and pierced the side of our Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately out of the side of this statue flowed blood and water and this man dropped dead immediately. Everyone that was in the synagogue froze. They could not believe what they were seeing. The man that was the rich man who was approached by the beggar, he had a daughter that had an infirmity since childbirth. He took a handkerchief and wiped some of the blood and the water and ran home and covered her with it, and she was made well. Others that were in the synagogue also covered themselves with the blood and whatever infirmities they had were made well. The Pope at that time was told of this event and he went with a delegation to that synagogue and took the cross and wiped as much of the blood and the water that they could that was left and did a whole procession around Alexandria in testament of our Lord Jesus Christ. And many of those that actually were there in the synagogue believed in our Lord. You may say, what a wonderful story in terms of people coming to Christ. But we need to not forget this poor beggar who blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, who sold the story and the promise of his salvation for worldly cares and desires and lusts. You may say, Tababuna, that's, you know, so extreme. We'll never denounce Christ. We love our Lord. Can I tell you that sometimes those that are lukewarm with their relationship with Christ can also fall into the same problem. I was reading the Australian newspaper a couple of weeks ago. I saw this very interesting to statistics as to when people graduate around 18 years old, people get married around 25 years old, people have children around 35 or 40 years old, and so on and so forth. And it had in there a statistic in terms of people that are born into a faith, by the age of 20, they stop practicing that faith. And it's only until the age of about 75 that they feel the need to go back to that faith. There's a period of 50 years where people forget about God, forget about his role in their life, stop listening to the Holy Spirit that's in them whenever they do something wrong and forget the whole objective of repentance. The trouble is, if that person is asked of their life throughout those 50 years, what answer will they give to the Almighty God? He will tell them the Holy Spirit is convicting you of not listening to me, convicting you of not coming back to me, convicting you of not believing in my salvation. So we also need to be on guard. And what our church gave us as a defense mechanism to continually be on guard is the sacraments that we have of confession and Holy Communion, where the Holy Spirit throughout the confession lifts up our sins and confirms us in the faith. And through communion, the Holy Spirit transforms the body and blood of Jesus Christ and allows us to continue to be a living part of him and confirmed in him and ever joyous in his salvation. This period of the fast, of the apostles' fast, sometimes we think it's just about service and focusing on service, and that is very much so a focus. But this is the period that we really need to get to know the Holy Spirit, need to know the gifts that we've been given, need to know how to be in real communion with the Holy Spirit such that it can confirm us throughout our journey in life 
unto the heavenly Jerusalem through God's promise. May our Lord grant us the opportunities to continue to inflame our hearts with the spirit of God that dwells in us, which will continue to teach us and guide us and give us comfort and confirm us in his way. And glory be to God forevermore. Amen. Oh, nee, uh,